Hi, I'm Thomas Schneider. I would like to talk about Japan's role in the Industrial Revolution of the latter part of the 19th century. The presentation is a student assignment for the seminar Tourism in Contemporary Japan, held in the winter semester 2022-23 at the University of Cologne. The Japanese representative sites identified are a silk mill and facilities associated with feedstock generation and supply chain integration in Tomioka City, Gunma Prefecture. The operation was set up in 1872 under a central government initiative to introduce modern industrial technology and sericultural practices. The ensemble was registered by UNESCO under number 1449 in 2014. First, a brief outline of the presentation. I want to investigate aspects such as the revolutionary nature of the operation, the timing and choice of location as part of a government-led agenda, the facilities as an example of Japanese-European industrial collaboration, and the instruction and innovation that radiated far beyond the sites themselves. I also want to touch on certain controversial aspects, including historic interpretations of labour relations and the popular marketing of heritage to secure funding, visitors, revenues and jobs. Approaching the subject matter cold, the first challenge was to objectively identify remnants of heritage in today's highly industrialized Japan. Which sites truly merit World War recognition and firmly belong to the major period? Our university's AI tool offered no intersects on the search terms World Heritage, Industrialization and Meiji, but did inspire avenues for further investigation. I tried UNESCO World Heritage and was offered a list. Three items stuck out. Silver mining was quickly eliminated. After all, it was the national adoption of fiat currencies linked through exchange rates set by treaty that spurred the globalization of trade. I then investigated Japan's submission of sites representative of iron and steel shipbuilding and coal mining. Important and interesting as they are, they seem primarily imitative of imported ideas and technology, albeit adapted to local conditions by entrepreneurs. In the end, I investigated why Tomioka silk earned a place on the world list. Ten inscription criteria may be invoked for UNESCO recognition. The proponent identified two that apply, namely interchange of human values over a span of time on developments in architecture and technology, and a tangible remaining example of a significant stage in human history thereof. The more detailed description of attributes applicable to Tomioka silk is summarized here for reference. They are best illustrated by what follows. In 1862, ten years prior to establishment of the Tomioka mill, still in the Edo period, raw silk and cocoons accounted for 86% of Japan's exports. In other words, the challenge was on to move up the value chain and gain a monopoly position. This opportunity, starting with a relative competitive advantage, was well spotted by Japan's ruling class. It was equally evident that leadership could only be achieved by acquisition of Western technology and best teaching, then continuously raising productivity and integration. This print from 1867 popularizes, from our perspective caricatures, government propaganda. A prosperous Japanese nation, note the ostentious kimonos, of dedicated silk harvesting women. The concept of mobilizing the nation's female workforce in the interests of industry was not uncontroversial, but certainly a strategic success factor. Instructively illustrated are the steps from larvae to unreading the silk cocoon the traditional way, together with the job of feeding the caterpillars the mulberry tree leaves. In contrast to airy silk, the cocoons are boiled before any moths can emerge. This is to prevent damaging the continuous thread increasing yield and quality. Here, the traditional silk production process is compared to the industrial process as implemented at the Tomioka mill. Also shown are the upstream sericultural components covered by the UNESCO World Heritage Listing. Japan's strenuous efforts to the world's number one spot eventually bore fruit. Alas, the seemingly unstoppable advance of natural silk was challenged by the invention of cheap synthetic fibers such as nylon by the late 1930s. Pearl Harbor spelled an end to Japanese exports. There is an afterplay. Production was sustained by efficient machinery, 
the labour-intensive rearing of silkworms contracted out. A stage in the development of an industry, closing the cycle of technology transfer between the world and Japan, began to take shape in the 1960s and 70s. Export of refined production machinery to other countries. Production in Tomioka ceased in 1986. Let us now look closer at the four components that comprise the UNESCO number 1449 industrial ensemble. First up, the mill. The town site is readily accessible, an important touristic consideration. Tomioka can be reached from Tokyo by bullet train, chilling at Takasaki for a total journey time of approximately 90 minutes. The surrounding sites are harder to reach and accordingly get less traffic. This picture from the 1940s brings into focus a primary consideration for a heritage site. Is the substance intact? Indeed, we see little difference on the aerial photograph from the 1940s to the present condition. Even though the facilities were temporarily switched to ammunition production during the Pacific War, they survived the conflict. The evolution of the site has been carefully cartographed, the original east and west cocoon warehouses marking out the site's characteristic U-shape with the silk reading plant at its base. Let's explore the international connection. Paul Brunat, a Frenchman living in Yokohama and already involved in silk trading, was requested by the newly installed Meiji government to advise on the architectural planning of the facility and the import of modern machinery. On this archive picture we see him, silk reel in hand, with his Japanese benefactors and associates. The other figure, pictured in the adjacent Italian portrait, is Yahe Tajima, who popularized modern sericultural techniques. A particular feature of the silk mill is its construction, blending Western elements with Japanese craftsmanship and local materials. The timber frame of the building side walls supports a Japanese style tiled roof. Ceiling trusses bridge a wide span, dispensing with intermediary ground supports. Again, rather than steel members, timber was used. The walls were filled using red clay fired bricks and mortar, made in Japan in a characteristic interlinking pattern. Large glass windows provided natural light and ventilation. Silk drilling machinery was powered by a central coal-fired steam engine that can still be seen today. Its arrival signaled the advent of Japan's industrial age, or previous plant up to this point having been water-driven. The chimney we see today is in its fourth incarnation. An impression of the original facility layout may be gained from this woodcut print. In an apparent error, a German flag has been hoisted, and on closer inspection we spot other inconsistencies to the architectural drawings. This is down to the artistic license taken by Japanese artists. On this slide, we see other key buildings. The female dorm, next to a large cherry tree, the clinic, next to pine trees, and the Western Inspector's house with flowers. Outlying component of the Silk Trail, Tajima Yahe's ha former house, termed Sericultural Farm in English, is pictured. The house has a staggered roof for ventilation and provides an optimal environment for raising silkworms. Other buildings on site include the Besso for the storage of mulberry leaves and an extension to the main building, the microscope room. We rediscover the home on an old photograph and see it represented in the educational work that bears Tajima's name, the new theory of sericulture. In the sidebar, by late Meiji, Kamitaro Toyama was selectively breeding silkworm hybrids, enhancing the quality and quantity of silk harvested. A national system was established whereby large silk producing mills provided farmers with superior silkworm eggs in return for exclusive purchase of the resulting standard bred cocoons. The practice of disseminating knowledge by practical tuition via centers of excellence is embodied by the inclusion of Takayama Company's Sericultural School in the UNESCO nomination. The school was established to spread the practice of Seon Iku, that is the raising of silkworms under optimum control of ventilation and temperature conditions. From its founding in 1888 to its closure in 1924, the school operated nationwide, 
dispatching instructors and students across the land. This again illustrates the importance accorded to best practice sharing across many diffuse sites, companies and small farming suppliers engaged in a national foreign income earning industrial endeavour. The ruins featured here should appeal to today's ecologically conscious generation. These facilities operated on sustainable energy. Arafune Azuyama Cold Storage entered service in 1905 and was expanded twice to a capacity of 1.1 million silkworm egg sheets by 1913. This offered competitive advantage, enabling yields to be raised twice to threefold by artificially stimulating multiple breeding cycles in a year. Cooling effect can be visually experienced or scientifically recorded. Ambient temperature over the annual cycle, in green, is compared to the cold airflow temperature measured at the site of former storage number one, in blue. The latter measurement correlates well with records of cold storage temperatures from 1911. It is speculated that cold airflow during the warmer months of the year is sustained thanks to ice trapped in permeable strata below ground. The mechanism constitutes a natural advantage for the location up until the advent of mechanical refrigeration technology, deployable anywhere, regardless of geology. We noted earlier that the low-cost advantages of Japan as a silk manufacturing base eroded with increasing wages and a rising yen post-World War II. Yet, for several decades, the labour component could be kept in check by continuously raising the mill's efficiency through automation and mechanisation, and lowering cost of supplies. Sakura Industries had taken over the Tomioka plant shortly before the breakout of hostilities between Japan and the US. Post-war, the company integrated vertically by founding new clothing businesses in the 1950s and diversifying activities to shopping malls and other retail. Nonetheless, operations in Tomioka became increasingly uneconomical. The final generation of machines, installed in the early 1970s, remains in place and in working condition. Importantly, the hands-on experience and capital invested in research and development by Japanese makers offered them a competitive edge to sell their machines across the world. Let us now turn to a more ambivalent story. Initially, work at the mill was limited to daylight hours. The employment of women, as in Europe, was progressive, though the four female educators hired in France left within a year or so. Tomioka Silk was positively received in Europe, gaining brand recognition with a second prize at the Vienna World's Fair of 1873. The story of nimble-fingered young Japanese women racing towards emancipation to enhance Japanese soft power in the world is portrayed in the NHK drama Aka Tazuki, aired in 2017. However, reality on the ground appears to have taken a turn for the worse as the foreigners left and competitive pressures mounted. According to JapaneseHistory.org, young women were tricked by agents into lowly paid, unhealthy work, sleeping in crowded company dorms to pay off debts. Electric light enabled the 18-hour day, workers then too exhausted to attend after hours schooling. The registration placed the responsibility with an authority. The fact that the government makes a public commitment at international level offers an assurance of sustainable protection. In the case of Tomioka, the mill was eventually gifted by Katakula Company. Freed from profitability constraints, a wider perspective could be adopted. Today, two MPOs support daily operations, a guides association and a beautification association. On the other hand, Professional preservation and maintenance requires specialist tooling, planning and know-how. This needs to be contracted and paid for. Impressive effort went into restoring the East Cocoon Warehouse, turning it into an exhibition and event space. How to measure success? If we benchmark on number of visitors, we face an impossible task. The hype associated with UNESCO registration did cause a jump. However, even the NHK special in 2017 was unable to arrest a seemingly relentless downward trend. It is not for want of trying. Entrance fees are hardly outrageous. The facility is in tip-top condition. 
The personal guides do a commendable job and even the self-guided visitor is well catered for. Can it be that the virtual world is too tempting today, that the effort required to physically visit a site judged disproportionate to the pleasure gained from being there, in the now, in person? I look forward to discussion, for which I've prepared a few prompts. Thank you.